Um, I guess, uh, first, uh, apologies. Um, I'm very new to this project. Uh, literally, just start with the role of project manager. Um, so I'm really just coming up to speed. Um, you're probably aware that there was a delay in starting the project in terms of recruiting uh, people to uh, undertake the project. So uh, I guess the first part of my slides is really about um, uh, sharing my interpretation and internalizing what the project actually m means. Um, and, and perhaps a little bit of background uh, about myself and why I've actually chosen to uh, un undertake the project. Um, so for the past, uh, Five years, uh, I've actually been uh, abroad. Um, 2011, I guess, in the recession and slightly more gloomy times, uh, I decided that I um, needed some professional development myself, uh, and I um, moved to the Middle East uh, and got involved with a, a startup of a, a new uh, polytechnic there. Um, and I guess what I'd like to do before I get into the details of the project is perhaps share some of the experiences. Um, um, from um, that international experience, I guess, um, in terms of comparing it to um, where we are here, here in Ireland uh, and uh, why I've chosen uh, effectively to um, uh, get involved in, in this project. So uh, when I moved to the Middle East, uh, one of the first uh, requirements that um, was made by the um, management team for recruiting staff was essentially that they, they should be triply qualified was the, the term that they were using and that meant that they obviously had to have their, their academic qualifications, uh, in their case a, a master's in their discipline or preferably a, a PhD. Um, secondly, that they would have to have a, a qualification in teaching and learning and, that, um, uh, and also um, a qualification in, in, in teaching a, a second language. Uh, but thirdly, um, that they had to be professionally qualified in, in their own discipline. So if they were uh, an engineer, they were expected to be either a chartered engineer or um, recognized in, in some way as part of the profession or for accounting as a chartered accountant and so on. So there, uh, what struck me most uh, about the, the, I guess the, the, the emphasis uh, on establishing that institution was the, the centrality really of um, teaching uh, and learning um, to the business. Uh, there was an entire uh, directorate um, um, established for, for teaching and to lear learning. Uh, and I'll share with you shortly, one of my colleagues um, recently was appointed uh, in New Zealand as a, um, a, as a deputy CEO or vice, pres uh, vice president uh, for, for teaching and learning. So the, the, the strategic emphasis on teaching and learning is something that um, really struck a chord with me and um, in terms of where uh, we are in Ireland I think it's great to see the, the strategic investment in uh, teaching and learning and the establishment of the, the National Forum. Um, the project itself I guess uh, I'm an engineer by background and uh, you're, you're probably aware that we have uh, three um, institutes of technology in Dublin so we've the DIT, uh, we've the Institute of Technology in Blanchestown uh, and we have uh, the Institute of Technology in Tala. And at some stage over the next few years, uh, those three colleges are, are expected to uh, merge uh, and possibly uh, become a technological university. So there is a, uh, a massive strategic change uh, underway. Uh, and um, I think there's going to have to be a, a huge emphasis on, on uh, professional development, uh, essentially as a a lever for enabling that to happen um, as the, the institutions essentially transform from being you know, um, local and regional colleges to being a, an international uh, university. Um, so big changes ahead. Um, with that in mind, what we're really looking at here is our, primarily our engineering staff, though we probably will look to broaden it out to the uh, STEM disciplines, uh, other technology disciplines like IT and so on, um, to look at what is needed uh, in terms of teaching and learning competencies uh, for uh, those staff to, to perform in, in their jobs. Um, and once we recognise what those competencies are, uh, essentially to put in place uh, opportunities for development based on the gaps uh, 
that exist at the moment. Um, one of the uh, interesting scenarios that uh, certainly happened over the last uh, five or six years was with the, the downturn, there was a um, downsizing of capacity, uh, for example, to deliver to trades, and that left a, a, a considerable number of um, trades lecturers um, at a point where they actually needed to re-establish their professional identity in some other discipline uh, and um, acquire new qualifications and skills. Uh, and I would say from uh, talking with colleagues, that's been uh, personally very challenging for a lot of them. Um, a lot of them have moved into completely new disciplines and have to, had to invest significantly in terms of time and, and I guess, money in terms of uh, acquiring uh, new skills. So it's not as if this is uh, unprecedented, and, and I think um, as we become a, a new institution, uh, expectations in terms of what we are, in terms of our identity as professional academics, is, is going to uh, change uh, as well. Um, uh, I, can't, I think the, the key thing here is, and uh, I'm glad to see it's very much part of the national framework, is that it's as much about a, a, an individual uh, uh, driven um, process um, as it is about uh, departments and schools and colleges um, managing that process. So, as you know, essentially as higher education institutions, we, we sell expertise, um, we sell qualifications or badges, and it's very important for our staff to be professionally uh, current um, in all aspects of teaching and learning, but also in their, their disciplines. Um, I think most of you are probably aware um, that you know, in the public sector in Ireland, we've had a, um, a performance management system that um, has been, uh, I guess, a challenge for a, a number of reasons. Uh, and again, I'll share with you a recent publication as to how uh, essentially that system has probably failed um, to a large degree. Um, and really, we need to look to alternative models um, uh, to encourage our staff to see the benefit of professional development, both for uh, their careers um, and, and personally, uh, as opposed to perhaps a, a slightly more um, industrial relations-led uh, model that there has been there in, in the past. Um, and I think, again, the, the, a key aspect of this is, um, you know, what sort of strategic priority does uh, professional development actually get in, in a new institution? Um, how do we recognise um, the, the progress that, let's say, individual schools or departments uh, have made in, in uh, investing in their um, academic staff is going to be uh, very, very important. Uh, I think there's going to be, have to be uh, some sort of incentivization around um, uh, and strategy-led incentivization, I guess, around encouraging uh, departments uh, to proactively manage the, the professional development of their staff. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the key thing with this is whatever framework we put in place, um, it has to be valued by, by all stakeholders, that from the um, engineering staff themselves to the uh, middle management or departmental managers. Um, right up to uh, the, the academic uh, leadership in the, in the college. Um, so again, just to share my, my uh, personal perspectives, as I said, this, this, someone actually just sent me this the other day, and it's, it's not about her, but it, what's interesting about it is uh, she has been appointed as a, a VP of Teaching and Learning in a Otago Polytechnic in New Zealand, which is a, a, a small, um, well, relatively small pr provincial um, institute of technology in New Zealand. But it, it does emphasize, again, the the centrality and the strategic importance that um, uh, many colleges are placing on, on teaching and learning now. Um, in, in, I suppose, slight contrast to that, one of the things that we did uh, when I was involved in the setup of the uh, Polytech in the Middle East was we engaged with the Higher Education Academy in the UK. Uh, and I think what, to me, stands out that's probably slightly different about the approaches is, is we also need to recognise that professional development isn't solely about um, teaching and learning competencies. Um, as an academic and as an engineer, um, I guess I need to be um, 
professionally current in my profession as an engineer uh, as much as professionally current uh, as, a, as an academic. And there are a whole uh, diverse range of activities that educators, I guess, are expected to be involved in as they progress through their career. Uh, that's not purely focused uh, on teaching, though uh, teaching and learning itself is, is obviously an essential competency for that. So as part of uh, this project, uh, we have uh, just begun um, uh, talks with Engineers Ireland uh, to see how they can actually offer us a platform for um, our engineering academics to become um, professionally qualified or to re-engage in their professional development. I think in the past there's been very much a view that as, uh, as let's say, a person has moved from an industrial uh, background uh, into the, or the academia, um, that the, the focus has changed and perhaps that uh, emphasis on being professionally current as an engineer has uh, got lost. So we're, we're engaging with Engineers Ireland really to see um, what they can offer us as a pathway to ensure that our academic staff uh, uh, can become uh, chartered engineers or professionally qualified uh, engineers. Um, the other aspect that I mentioned briefly with this was this idea of um, performance management in the public sector and there's been a, a recent uh, publication approved by uh, Financial Accountancy and Management that looked at um, really, I guess, the challenges that the public sector has had here in um, um, making performance management work. Uh, and what was really striking about the, the actual article was, you know, uh, one of the big challenges we have in Ireland is it, it's still a relatively small, homogenous society where we know who probably uh, matters a lot more uh, than... Um, performance uh, or um, you know uh, positivistic measures I guess um, and that's something I think we, we still have to take account that uh, unless um, staff can see the connection between uh, performance um, and uh, professional development uh, and opportunities for career development promotion uh, we, we have to overcome that challenge, I, I guess, and it will be a, a key aspect of the project. Uh, finally, uh, just again, on my personal perspectives, I've mentioned this idea of the, the three uh, institutions uh, um, essentially uh, merging uh, in the next few years. Um, I'd say IT Blanchestown and IT Tala are two relatively small colleges in, in comparison to, to Dublin Institute of Technology. But the overall staff numbers in engineering are, are still um, uh, relatively manageable, I guess, um, uh, in, in terms of engaging with them personally. So I, I think there will be uh, a, a key aspect of this project will be really sitting down with the actual staff themselves, um, either in focus groups or individual interviews, uh, and finding out what it is they actually would like to see in terms of opportunities uh, for professional development. And also, I think, um, engaging with the management and, and looking at, well, how are expectations going to change? Uh, one of the um, tensions, I guess, that uh, Jen Harvey in Dublin Institute of Technology mentioned to me recently was the, you know, the, the balance between... Um, time allocated to, to research versus time allocated to teaching and learning. Uh, right now, there is a mandatory requirement for uh, all new academic staff in DIT to take a, a, a teaching and learning qualification in, in, in their first year. Um, but there is, uh, I guess, pressure on that uh, because of the uh, other aspects uh, um, and performative uh, aspects that are expected a, a, as a role as an academic in a new institution like a technological university. Um, so um, I guess the, the first thing, uh, what I'd like to achieve out of it is this notion of being, as I called, triply qualified. Uh, I suppose it's a little bit of a, a, a jargon, but uh, you know, that we recognize that you know, 
the professional identity of a, uh, an engineering lecturer is multifaceted. It's been, uh, about being a professional engineer, it's about being a, a professional educator, um, and um, it's also making sure that they have the, the, the best possible academic qualifications as well. Um, and how do those academic staff actually maintain the professional currency? Um, uh, as a professional engineer, w one of the ways they can do that is to obviously engage in, in research and consultancy, uh, and that has to be uh, managed into uh, workload planning, um, professional development, uh, and so on. If, the, if the, those um, staff, which traditionally um, would have uh, had a strong industry mandate, um, uh, if they are actually actually going to maintain their their, their currency, um, obviously this is the, the framework itself. Um, I would agree with the, I guess the, the last uh, panel in terms of trying to interpret the framework. Um, it, it it comes across as, as a, I guess a, a little bit philosophical, um, possibly a little bit uh, jargonistic. But that's good as well, and I think that it actually allows um, um, flexible impl implementation uh, and allows us to interpret how best to make use of this framework. Um, one of the things that I possibly will look to add in terms of uh, applying it to, to engineers is how do you develop um, uh, professional behaviours? Um, competencies are obviously uh, one aspect of knowledge and skills, which is mentioned, and values are obviously mentioned. But they often culminate in, in explicit um, behavioural norms, um, and that's something I would very much like to try and um, develop a charter for, so people understand and expect what it means to behave as a, a, a professional engineering academic, I guess. Um, so I guess really what I'd like to say about the project is, uh, for me, it's very much going to be a, a two-fold approach. There's going to be the, the emphasis on uh, teaching and learning, uh, and secondly, there's going to be the, the emphasis on um, engineering uh, as the profession uh, and what skills they require for, for each. Um, so in terms of the, uh, how would I put it, the, the leadership aspect of it, I think it's important that there are processes put in place um, that are easy to follow, that are possibly not necessarily associated with the, the, the baggage of industrial relations in the past, uh, and people can sit down with their line managers uh, and discuss where their careers are, are going. Um, that to me is uh, particularly important, um, that there's a a process for ongoing dialogue between staff uh, and their, their managers, um, and that there's a process there as well to look holistically at a departmental and school level and say, well, what actual skills uh, does the school need? Um, where do we uh, need expertise? And to uh, work out uh, how best to fit the, the training uh, and, and development opportunities for staff in, into those needs. Um, Sorry, I'll just move on here very quickly. Just in terms of where the project is, is now, um, so essentially, I think the last time Jenna Harvey updated you on the project, we were really waiting f uh, to appoint a, a project manager. Um, a steering group has been put in place, um, and it largely consists of um, um, people from HR, um, teaching and learning, and engineering across the three colleges. Um, I have literally been uh, appointed into the role to, to look after the project over the next 12 to 18 months uh, and currently uh, working uh, on the uh, detailed uh, breakdown of the, the work plan. Um, for the summer months, uh, the next focus is to appoint a research assistant. We have uh, just advertised uh, that post uh, internally within the three colleges and we hope to have someone hired um, prior to the summer breakup so that that person can, can uh, essentially hit the, the ground running um, in the new academic year. Um, as I said, the, the detailed work plan has just started. Um, and I guess the, the next stage um, over the summer months is we'll be very much focusing on the, 
what I call the, the desktop research, was looking at what's already out there, um, both in terms of academic papers, but also in terms of policy documentation, operational plans, and so on. Um, the focus for uh, September to December really is, a, for me, about engaging with the different stakeholders. So that's engaging with the staff themselves, the engineering staff themselves, uh, the uh, management of the three colleges, um, that's both the disciplinary management, so the, let's say the heads of department and the heads of schools in, in the colleges, uh, and also uh, uh, want as part of, of, of this framework. Um, the idea, I guess, is that by the end of this year, we will have a defined set of uh, teaching uh, and learning competencies. Um, I would hope that it is stage-based, uh, depending on uh, your point in your career, so uh, what it means, what sort of skills you need as a, a new entrant a academic versus what you need as a, a, um, a senior academic. And finally, uh, for the latter part of the year, we're, we're into the development phase of the project where we actually d develop the, the framework. I guess that's really what I've got to report uh, at this stage. Again, uh, Apologies, I'm literally just started on the project, but I would welcome feedback as I get to grips with what's required over uh, the next few months. Okay.